Hello, I'm your host, Effie Pilarino, and uh, today I am interviewing another Italian. It's been the month of a global outreach to Italians. I started with Roberto Carpedeci, who's in Singapore. Um, I spoke to Paolo Cironi, who's between Frankfurt and, and Milan, and today I have the pleasure to speak to Francesco Burelli, who's a partner at uh, Arkwright Consulting, and he's in Dubai. Welcome, uh, uh, Francesco. Thank you, Effie. Thank you for having me. It, you know, it, it's, it's a pleasure to connect with you. We have never met, but there's no such thing anymore, right? We can uh, electronically meet with, with a great facility um, these these days, and um, we connected because um, I saw a great report from uh, our consulting that we'll be discussing a little bit more. But before we we deep dive on a very interesting topic around business models and 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 um, a fintech and and your uh, special your experience both in the payment sector, but much broadly speaking in, in ecosystems. Tell us where you're coming from, so to speak, in your professional uh, journey. It, I would say, you know, in your innovation uh, journey and, and how that's been for you and how you've arrived where you are today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, Thinking about it, uh, as everything in life is a combination of personal choices, effort, and luck. So there are opportunities that come everybody's way. There's a personal investment that you make and so on. So it's a combination of all of those uh, um, factors together. I operate mostly in the strategy functional space. Uh, uh, that this is where I position myself uh, and I had the opportunity to, to grow professionally after my MBA many, many years ago. In the early days, I was uh, focused on customer value management, uh, mostly in, in the telco space. But because of uh, NIT awareness out of a very old coding hobby, I ended up having an opportunity in transaction banking between the business and the IT space. From there, I started working more into the industry and I got involved throughout the years uh, across any type of uh, payment services. These are sectors that have been subject to industry convergence and digital transformation from the very early days of the dot-com. Uh, this is what is now known as digital, digital transformation. In the beginning, it was called the wave of e-commerce and, and similar. So uh, then over time, payments related engagement became more digital channel engagement, uh, marketplaces opportunities, and so on, taking me more and more frequently into the cross-sector space, uh, um, despite the fact that payments and banking are still a big part of, um, of what I do. Now, this said, the first uh, uh, partnership and uh, platform uh, ecosystem project that I've done was in the very old days, immediately after the MBA, so I'm talking about uh, the, the late 90s, uh, and, and we developed the project without even knowing that what was a partnership between a local bank, uh, the office of a mayor, uh, the local, uh, uh, the major university in town, uh, the transport authority and so on, then it would have become one of, uh, one of those business models that can be described within the label platform and, and, and ecosystem. So started early without that, as, it, as I say, it's a combination of effort and luck. Where is that? Where was that, Francesco? You're talking where in, in, in the UK, in France? Oh, that was in Italy, in the old yeah. days, in Italy, after, after my MBA. Okay. okay. So, uh, I, mean, I know that you, you are a, a co-author of um, a book, uh, Ecosystem Canvas Framework, and I know a lot of the work that you're doing is, is around that. It, tell us how Arkwright was born and what its focus is. 
So um, before uh, moving to, to your question, uh, I've been co-author of a number of articles, publications uh, around the, the different, different channels and uh, um, editorials, uh, publications, and so on. Uh, the Ecosystem Canvas uh, is a template. It's not yet, uh, or it's not a book. It is a business model that was uh, developed jointly with uh, uh, Professor Shipilov from, from INSEAD and has been made available to uh, the industry to use out of uh, a, a release on uh, uh, INSEAD uh, knowledge. So the, the ecosystem canvas is, a, is an instrument for everybody to use within the space. Now, going back to, to Arkwright, um, Arkwright was established in 86 as a spin-off from a major strategy house in the, in the Nordics. It's born out of a geographical opportunity on one side, and in those days, the recognition that there was a wide space for a different type of business model in strategy consulting. So first of all, in those days, that uh, major strategy firm had marginal presence in the Nordics in terms of offices. So that has offered the opportunity to, to some of my uh, long tenure colleagues uh, um, to establish what has then become Arkwright. On the other side, there was a recognition that independent analysis, uh, um, independent and fact-based analysis needed to be complemented by a deeper understanding of the client, clients' industries and businesses um, versus what was in particular in those days, uh, a very generalist approach within strategy consulting. So between that uh, and the combination that uh, uh, Strategic advice has very little value when it is not implemented. So in order to make it more implementable while keeping the independence of the analysis and problem solving, recommendation, formulation, and so on, uh, these could have been more impact impactful when developed working in closer connection with clients. So uh, in a summary, Artright was born out of a wide space geographically and um, a diversification of business model in strategy consulting. Now, Artright operates globally out of uh, four offices, is a strategy boutique. And uh, in addition to having uh, the strategy consulting practice, there are also a couple of sister companies. There's Arkwright X, that is an innovator, is an innovation incubator for um, startups, and Arkwright Digital, that is a digital agency for uh, the development of um, technology solutions that are then implemented out of uh, the various uh, recommendations. The three companies are operating independently the three businesses but there's a lot of complementarity between the three as a, a, a small ecosystem we can call it which which brings me to before we go into the report that interests me a lot to, to discuss with you it's a recent report Let, tell me why should we care be, to to think about the difference between a platform and an ecosystem uh, it, it, this for me is a very important topic to understand. So let's start with, with that. How do you see that difference? Okay, so before we get into the difference, let's talk about the importance of understanding what we're talking about. Because platform, ecosystem, and partnership are the three most abused and confused terms in the history of business, at least from my experience and perspective. Everything is a platform, everything is an ecosystem, regardless if it is a value chain, a group of unrelated company operating in geographical proximity, uh, and so on. A client is a partner, a supplier is a partner, and, and an employee is a partner, and, and, and so on. So, there is a lot of uh, um, ambiguity in this, uh, in this term. In most companies' ambition often include platform and ecosystem objective these days, without in many instances properly understanding what the actual business model is implied within that, that label. This is a realization that we had out of client experiences that prompted the thinking behind a post that was released on Insea Knowledge in December 2020. Uh, it is called Do Not Confuse Platform with Ecosystems. So let's get into the, the two, the two um, business models because they are 
two distinctive business models, even if ecosystem it is, can be considered a subsection, a subgroup of uh, the platform business models. So uh, quoting out of the, of the, the, the post, uh, a platform is an asset that removes friction from the market. These are very old business models, like a marketplace facilitate transaction between buyers and sellers. And by reducing the cost of the friction in the transaction, they achieve scale, they attract both parties and they, they grow in, uh, in, in size. So transactions within a platform share a similar nature. They can be purchases, they can be um, an acquisition of a, a software and, and so on. So there is a contextuality uh, to, to, to it. And in these days, these business models have become digital simply because a lot of business have gone online. Now, an ecosystem, uh, we take once again a definition from, uh, from uh, the, the post, is uh, a group of firms that are linked through non-generic complementarities uh, or investment in mutual, in mutual adaptation. So the ecosystem members have to coordinate to create a unique value proposition for uh, the customer. And this value proposition would not exist without the underlying ecosystem. So uh, the, the ecosystem is enabled by a digital platform that facilitate a set of interactions across a customer and different suppliers or providers uh, that are somehow connected in a thematic contextuality. So now, how does that differ from a partnership? Well, a partnership is a, a, a formal agreement between two companies that collaborate in order to do something. Not all um, ecosystems uh, necessarily need to have very strict partnerships uh, by the side of the all participants in order to exist. I'll give you an example. Let's take Vitality. Vitality is uh, an ecosystem value proposition in the insurance space uh, offered to health conscious customers uh, and that facilitate their living healthy um, uh, lifestyle. Now, within this space, we have one company that has initiated and it is the core orchestrator of this ecosystem that is um, Discover Insurance, depending on the country that could be some core partners like large gym chains and uh, a number of non-partner participants that can be easily replaced within an ecosystem like uh, uh, an healthy food supermarket, an organic uh, food supplier, uh, an healthy uh, vegan uh, restaurant and, and so on, a physiotherapy provider and, and so on. So uh, within the participants to an ecosystem, some may be partners, some may be not. There are ecosystems that operate without any form of partnerships across the various participants. Uh, others instead that come into being out of partnership. There are partnerships that result into uh, value proposition that are not platform or not ecosystems. Like for example, you have the, the famous um, uh, Renault-Nissan uh, partnership that is not necessarily a platform or an ecosystem in the, within the context of the two definitions that I just formulated. The two companies collaborate. They have through the collaboration optimized the supply chain, production lines, and so on. Um, and that's a very successful partnership that, that has, uh, is in the history of, uh, of management and is subject to, to many studies uh, academically, but it is not necessarily a partnership or uh, um, a platform or an ecosystem. It just happened that the term partner has the, shared the same amount of ambiguity and, and overuse as platform and ecosystem, hence me quoting it at the, the beginning of my, my answer. Great, great. So let's let's touch upon the report um, uh, that whose theme and, and title is from platform to ecosystems, developing high value business models. And, and in that report, you are comparing some metrics to, to sort of frame your thesis 
uh, like price earning ratios, revenue per employee, revenue growth, and so on. The, the basic thesis being that with less employees, you can have high growth, you can have high revenues and multiples of P's compared to businesses that are not platforms or uh, platform-based ecosystems. Tell us about the methodology. And of course, this study for our listeners is not only a finance study, meaning focused on FinTech and financial services, it's much broader uh, you look at various industries because this thesis is validated across different sectors. And then you present some examples, but tell us about the methodology and the importance of the results. Uh, thank you for your question. So uh, there is a common understanding that platforms and ecosystem, common, common sense, uh, common knowledge, uh, perform better or are higher value propositions. There are a couple of studies that have been released over the years uh, looking at the numbers and we wanted to, to develop our own validation of this uh, hypothesis, this working hypothesis. So uh, the methodology was based on the detailed analysis of uh, a set of annual report, a sample of annual report, analyst report and industry literature for a group of companies. So we've taken the top 100 listed companies out of six stock exchanges, and we looked into their businesses, categorizing them as a platform, an ecosystem, whenever a platform and ecosystem constitute the primary business that they operate or the vast majority of it, or otherwise as a non-platform and ecosystem within their own subsector um, accordingly to, to the various uh, findings. Now, the research, I have to say, has had some challenges because these days there's a lot of companies that are developing platform and ecosystem propositions. But if this is one of the many solutions that are implemented by a company and constitute a minority or a small portion of their revenues, then we ended up classifying them as a traditional business within their own uh, relevant, uh, relevant sectors. So we grouped together all the platform and ecosystems and all the others, and then we started uh, we, we went into the financials and we looked into out of the figures of the annual report, calculating some indicators, uh, leading to the conclusions that effectively platform and ecosystems have, um, out of a statistically relevant sample, better uh, performance. And uh, when comparing the valuation, in particular the price earning ratio that the market is recognizing to these companies, they have uh, um, an higher, um, an higher ratio, an higher recognition. Now, uh, we took the, the, um, the reports and then we tried to do also different type of uh, permutation looking within each sector and so on. But the more granular you get, the more it is difficult to do a proper classification and to make proper um, proper comparison of the data. So the, we got to the conclusion that there was an excessive amount of arbitrarity. So we kept it to the level that was then presented to, to, to the report. But, but you do present in the report a, a couple of examples, specific companies to, to highlight, you know, how they are an ecosystem and a platform and, you know, a variety of them. Uh, from, from a fintech perspective, uh, you, you present a couple of uh, relevant examples. You have Grab, uh, the, the ecosystem. You have, uh, if I recall correctly, Square, and then the Japanese or the Korean, rather, uh, Kakao and, and Lime, correct? A K Bank, Kazikorn Bank, uh, that has developed an ecosystem in its own right. Uh, that ended up being complementary to a competing one of, of, uh, of line. They, they both uh, lifestyle uh, customer journey uh, based ecosystems. So th there's a number of these. So we, we took out some uh, examples. Uh, there's, there's a number of these around the globe. And as you can see, they go across industry. I mean, Grab is coming from uh, um, the, the the, right. the, uh, the, uh, the riding industry is not a financial services company, but 
um, because of uh, enabling transaction and different interaction throughout the daily journey of customers, there is an element of value exchange in, uh, uh, in facilitating a payment. That's also one of the functions that uh, as part of the enabling platform, Grab, uh, Grab offers. So uh, you earlier on mentioned the, the financial service. In reality, this type of value proposition tend to go cross sector or within a sector they tend to go cross step within the value chain well beyond the immediacy of a customer supplier uh, relationship. Very so, and, and I have to say that we, just as an anticipation, we got a second report uh, that is in advanced phase of, of, of development uh, that will be focusing on the B2B sector with a very, very strong uh, degree of attention on, uh, on financial services. Uh, simply because while we take uh, the, the, with the first report, we, we made the point that there is a cross sector um, um, cross-sector, how can I say, relevance uh, in, uh, in this business model. It is not uh, exclusive. There are um, similar value propositions that develop within industries as well. And while everybody in thinking platform and ecosystem think of uh, Amazon or Grab or propositions that are uh, consumer facing, customer retail customer facing, in reality, we have very successful cases and examples and experiences on our side uh, as a consultant within the B2B space. So uh, obviously we cannot publish around about our projects uh, because they, these are subject to confidentiality, but we have done an analysis in the industry and there's going to be a follow-up in not too long with a second report uh, with this type of focus. Excellent, uh, that is a great uh, point because it is true that everybody's talking about consumer facing use cases um, and especially you know taking a Chinese you know the, the Alibaba WeChat um, uh, example and, and and the super app success model uh, which are all consumer uh, mostly consumer facing what I want to ask you is in this world where this so much um, supply, if you want, of uh, software as a service of anything you want uh, out there, being it a banking license, being it any part of uh, the value chain in, in finance. How can you build a sustainable business model since it is so easy to get the technology and, and create an architecture, how can you really create what we as, as old timers would call a moat uh, or what Warren Buffett calls a moat in a business, basically a really a sustainable business model? Well, software as a service is not any different from any other product and, and service. You know, success and sustainability is dependent on the ability to generate value for customers and for ourselves uh, with, on the ability to capture it and to do it at uh, a scale. So as such, from a strategic perspective, most can be built in many ways. Uh, these go from having patents, uh, unique services, establishing, being able to establish and defend higher switching costs for, uh, for our customers, or alternative modes derive from the ties of the network of a company they're operating in. So we're getting into the uh, in, towards an ecosystem type, type of argument. Now, platform and ecosystem models are a way of establishing modes once they are established and they get to critical mass, because ultimately they result into uh, longer customer lifetime uh, duration, uh, lower cost of acquisition, increased retention rates, and, and so on. Now, this said, platform and ecosystems are a way of establishing modes, but these models are enabled by technology. But we need to pay a, a bit of attention and make a distinction between technology providers that have unique, irreplaceable role in enabling a specific function or a 
value proposition and so on, and others instead that are just commodity suppliers and that are easy to replace. Everybody has the ambition to, to, to pay an instrumental role within a platform or an ecosystem. But if I may, let's say a data analytics company or an artificial intelligence provider that is enabling a specific function that can be easily replaced by somebody else. So there's nothing unique in what I do. Then my role is that of a supplier. I don't have really, uh, how can I say, a unique uh, privileged position within any value proposition. So ultimately in establishing modes a software as a service, uh, is the same as any other business. Uh, and he has his own challenges and, and dependencies in order to get to such privileged position. I, I, I see the point that you're making. You're really uh, making a distinction between um, a software vendor, if you want, um, that can be replaced and, and another one that provides a software that unlocks some, some value within the business model and, and cannot be replaced by anybody else. It, Absolutely. You, you if, I add, it. Go ahead. if I can add something onto this, uh, in our experience talking again with customers, in particular with technology customers, everybody has the ambition to be a key enabler in a platform or an ecosystem. These days, uh, it is an exception not to have that type of argument or discussion at one point or, or another with, uh, with executives. But on the other side, uh, similarly to the clarity in the definition, there is very much a need to have a very factual and objective view about uh, and perception about the position and the capability that the company has. Everybody thinks of being unique, but in reality, uh, there is a very often a distinction between what we hope we are as a company and what we hope we offer and what we actually are and how our clients are perceiving it. So that is also a, a, an absolute key prerequisite uh, that is needed to develop a, a very sustainable long-term uh, strategy for any firm, including us. Okay. Francesco, you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence and there's so much, um, if you want, uh, piloting and, and um, use, uh, especially in, in financial services, but um, it's still not clear uh, whether the impact is, is there. I wanted to ask you where you see opportunities in the AI space and also in the very important digital identity space. Through, through your work, do you see um, opportunities and in which uh, area? So, well, uh, opportunities in, uh, so data is pervasive this day. And, and, and artificial intelligence together with uh, analytics uh, are two key instruments to derive value from, from data. So as it is pervasive, uh, the role and the value and the opportunities of artificial intelligence are absolutely uh, universal. Now, there's two elements out of artificial intelligence uh, that are important. One in machine learning and the ability to automate processes to the point that uh, uh, they emulate uh, the, the, how can I say, the value added out of human judgment and the ability to analyze and take, uh, and take decisions. And um, on the other side, out of the ability to see patterns uh, and gain insights out of data that would be otherwise not uh, um, fully realized in, their own, in, in its own potential value. So artificial intelligence is absolutely, um, uh, how can I say, universal in terms of applicability. Areas where we see um, potential in, from our work are in the fraud prevention, in uh, the automation of specific tasks like uh, uh, AML and, and uh, completely in KYC, in particular in managing uh, what are the, the override cases where there's no clear decision that would require human intervention to, to, to validate uh, um, specific uh, set of requirements. Uh, in customer profiling, uh, there is quite a lot of uh, potential in uh, um, uh, the marketing space, 
in, uh, in the ability to, to provide uh, uh, customer inside decisioning and, uh, and offers. Uh, so the, the, the single instant pricing uh, at time of, um, of potential exchange or commercial opportunity and, and uh, uh, so on. In terms of digital identity, digital identity is something that uh, while it is, uh, how can I say, uh, wide ranging in applicability and reach across sectors and, and type of entities, uh, it, it is a bit more focused around uh, the government space, uh, the e-commerce space, wherever there is an exchange and there is validation, an exchange of value, there is a validation of uh, um, an identity and some, some credentials. So in here we have uh, the government, uh, uh, the commerce space, uh, automating specific processes like uh, uh, conditional access to uh, content or access or um, assets uh, that uh, need to be subject to specific privileges and uh, and authority and uh, and so on. What we see in the digital space uh, is the fact that uh, the, the digitalization of identity, so the credential that define uh, an identity, is uh, um, creating a lot of efficiencies and uh, opportunities for companies. Uh, in uh, leveraging artificial intelligence, for example, as one of the areas uh, in order to validate uh, uh, the identity. So all, all of this has a lot of digital content as you can gather from, from my, from my um, thinking, but you mentioned two of the sectors that are going to see uh, the bigger, um, a, a very big share of investment and, and development over the, the coming years. Right, so, so the journey has started, but we are early in, in the process. Francesco, before we, we close, uh, a couple of, of questions. First of all, uh, our listeners, where can they find you, uh, Arkwright, and um, uh, follow you, uh, what you are sharing from your client uh, journeys uh, and so on? So obviously Artright as a, as a website is www.artright.de. Uh, there you can find the, the Artright related publications. Otherwise uh, I, can, I can suggest LinkedIn or the usual channels, uh, Googling, Googling me out. Then the Bean publications on, on Insert Knowledge, there will be others through other academic channels uh, that, that are in making. So, uh, I have to say that uh, I am a moderately social media, if not social media adverse person. So I tend to use the channels that, that I have to. Uh, LinkedIn is one of those, while because of bandwidth and, and capacity, and then on the other side of recognition that I prefer to, to stick in channels that tend to have higher quality of, of content. I stay away from, from, from other most mass market type of, type of environment. It is all, ultimately, it is all about bandwidth, but I'm easily foundable out of, um, can be easily found out of Google and out of LinkedIn. Great, and, and tell us what you are excited about uh, these days in terms of your work, you mentioned that already an upcoming publication around platform uh, and ecosystem business models at the B2B level. Uh, that um, is, is very important. And also tell us if you're looking forward to a vacation and where you're going, something more personal. Oh, well, uh, so first of all, th there is a lot going on. There's a, there's a new report in the making. There is a bit more academic content in the making as well, but it's too early to, to how can I say, announce it publicly. The, the report will be out in any way in four to six weeks at the, at the latest. Um, in terms of, of excitement, there's a lot happening in the, in the industry. There's a lot of merger and acquisitions that are starting taking place, uh, in particular in, uh, in the, 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 payment, uh, the payment environment uh, within uh, the payments and open banking, so the convergence with, uh, with data, what is now becoming open finance, there is a lot of activity and a lot of consolidation out of a space that 10, 15 years ago 
was dominated by new entrants and, and fintechs. Now we see consolidation and aggregation of uh, value proposition and companies with the major, with the, the big brands uh, uh, stepping in and, and making making a statement, taking a position in, in that. So um, that that is something that is really really fascinating to see happening in uh, in the industry. Finally, in terms of vacation, um, I have to say that these days traveling is. Uh, most countries are starting reopening, but I personally tend to have uh, a pretty cautious, uh, cautious approach. If I have to travel, I will go back to, to Italy to see my family, as I haven't seen them in, in now over one year, one year and a half. Uh, otherwise, I'll just take the chance to, to, to stay home as my, my reading book and the pile of books that I got to, to go through is, is pretty, pretty sizable and is keeping growing. So uh, I would take the, the opportunity to, to, to enjoy a bit of home time uh, on, on that. Not, not that. Not that there's not been plenty of it during the pandemic, uh, but it is simply a realization that uh, while I would personally, as a perspective, while I, I, I would really like to enjoy the freedom, I don't completely believe that we are out of the, the, the ditch. So as such, so, um, so what, I hope there's some fiction books in your pile of, of, of books. Uh, how about you share with us one fiction or one non-fiction from your pile? Not that it's necessarily the first one that you pick, but what comes to mind? Uh, well, I got uh, some latest books uh, that are the continuation of the Asimov uh, um, uh, Empire uh, series. Uh. Uh, with one that is, is being written by other authors uh, that, that are concluding the, the series. I had it for, for a few months there. And then uh, I got a couple of history books uh, um, that, that I'm really looking forward to, 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 to get into. Uh, in particular, these are about Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian and, and Japanese history. So okay. uh, there is business content, but it's, it's not all business. Yes, and in any case, uh, uh, th those lines are blurring anyway, right? And uh, I always say that I wish that I knew better when I was studying um, uh, finance, uh, my, my MBA, my PhD. I now understand that there should have been history classes. I would have appreciated them, at the, but at the time, you know, I didn't think of this. But now I understand that that's even more important to, to, to understand them globally, the, the, the geographic uh, differences in, in history, of course, are very much linked to the economy and to, to, to banking and financial markets. But that requires a bit of um, white hair to appreciate it, correct? Uh, a little bit. It, come, it comes with time in reality that there's a lot to learn from a lot of different branches of science and a lot of disciplines and everything goes together like a puzzle and enrich what we are, so. Exactly, whether it's behavioral economics, psychology, uh, you know, the, the uh, rationality and then all the structural issues that get involved. Well, Francesco, it was great um, speaking with you. Thank you so much and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you very much for having me.